All right, so I try never to give the same presentation twice. This isn't, isn't the same deck from Paris, uh, but it does have all of my diagrams. I know I do dense slides, but they're there uh, to go beyond the inspiration and to kind of say, well, here's some concrete things that you can go back and really take into your practice in the digital workplace. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very fortunate that um, I get to spend a lot of time working with large organizations as they try and grapple with all things digital. Uh, I work on you know, digital engagement on the outside uh, and study and help organizations with that. I work on the inside, both in you know, what, we, what we've called um, social business, enterprise social networking for a long time, as well as digital workplace. I now see a high watermark of interest and growing still in saying we have too many tools in the workplace. They're not integrated. They're not contextual. Uh, we have this kind of amalgam, this random collection. This, I call it a jumble of apps. And it's clear that we're actually going to end up with, there's, there's no way we can reduce the number. We're only going to get more and more technology, more and more solutions in our organization. So how do we make sense of it? And so, um, we, you know, we've uh, talking with Bjorn, we've, we've come up with this building blocks concept. We have these tremendously powerful building blocks in our organizations. We started with things like document management, right? And then we went into, you know, collaboration and into, into social environments and into online community. We kept making new discoveries, right? In these wonderful building blocks. Uh, and now we're about to get so many more. The pace of change is at an all-time high. And I'm, I'm sure all of you have heard the quote, you know, when the rate of change outside your organization greatly exceeds the rate of change inside, something will break, right? You can't sustain that. And I still see organizations who have aging environments. In fact, the larger a company is, the more likely they're going to have a very uneven mix uh, of, of tools um, that, aren't, that don't inspire their workers, that don't make them effective, that actually get in their way. We're going to talk about the collaboration paradox. So I want to talk about two things today. First, the trends kind of where things are taking us uh, to help us understand how the building blocks are evolving the building blocks of work, of the digital workplace. And then we're going to look at those building blocks themselves and see if that we can understand them a little bit better. Uh, because what we're missing, when I talk to people about the digital workplace, they say, well, first, can you define that for me? What do you mean by digital workplace? That's how the conversation starts almost every time. What, what is it to you, right? Is it your desktop? Is it your intranet? A lot of people put the center of focus on the intranet. We've moved a lot of to uh, the enterprise social network. Oh, that's the new center. We can put everything in the activity stream. And I actually like that model, but it's not very common. In fact, we have very few organizing principles for the digital workplace. Everyone describes it differently. And we're still trying to figure this out. And that's OK. You know, what's so funny is that even though we've been developing technology for in the workplace for 30 years in a big way, it's been a lot longer, about 40 years, but really investing for 30 years, we're still in what I call the cave painting days. It's going to take us another few decades to figure this out. And all the data shows we're going to have more change in the next 10 than the last 40. Uh, and so how do we ride that change? So that's, that's really the, our challenge here. So digital disruption is here. Um, you may have seen this. This is uh, from, from Harvard Business Review. It shows that instead of being able to kick the can down the road, I, you know, we used to talk to senior executives and go, hey, if, you're not, if that doesn't happen, if that not, not affecting me in a big way this year, I can put it off. If that's not inside my quarter, I can put it off. I have to make my numbers or I, ha I need to worry about today. I can't worry about tomorrow. Well, that's changing now. The data here shows that uh, most executives believe that moderate or massive digital disruption is going to happen in the next year right, to their industry. And we've seen this now in insurance and in finance and all these very protected industries. Healthcare now for the first time is really being affected. It's a highly regulated industry, but there's all these startups that are really changing it. People are now expecting it. We have to operate in new ways to, to, to address or fend off this disruption. Um, and so now we see there's a lot more interest now at a very high level in saying, let's get better organized because now we can't wait. Right? We, we we're aware that we can't wait. And we, we, we know, we know uh, we've heard the data. You know, most of the Fortune 500 companies credited in the year 2000 are gone. And, are, uh, and, and the average lifespan of the, of the large organization has plummeted to about 13, 14 years from you know, a nice, healthy, robust uh, lifespan, of, an average lifespan of 60 years back in 1960. 
Uh, and what's the primary cause? This is from a MIT um, technology review article that looked at what is the cause for this curve. And there are a lot of causes, but the, the biggest one is failure to adapt to technology change. Right, so this is, this is really what we're, we're facing is, is our metabolisms are, are, are too slow. They're too traditionally designed. They're simply not designed to cope with what we now live in, which is exponential times. Up until recently, we lived in linear times, and change was manageable. Now we need to think of all new ways to organize for change. And part of that's going to be, how do we, how do we, what's the organizing principle for the digital workplace? One way of asymmetrically thinking about it is the bring your own technology model, saying, you know what, design your own workplace. Just tell us where the data is so we can make sure it's safe and we'll make it secure, right? Uh, and you can create your own. And some companies actually do that. I've seen even large organizations adopt that model. And they say, you can create, you can use the best tool that you think there is for the job as long as you've taken care of some basic principles, right? Um, so maybe that's one way, a new way of thinking about it. But that, again, is not a leading model. So this, this traditional change, we're reaching an inflection point where, where some of us are starting to break. Uh, I was working with a very large bank last year who had 70% of their, their workstations were still on Windows XP. Why? Because they had nearly 3,000 legacy applications they had to upgrade first, right? That ran the business. So it's this legacy that's starting to hold us back. That investment of 30 or 40 years in the digital workplace um, and in other IT is, is what's holding us back. 80 to 90% of our budgets in most organizations go to maintaining it not, and not going into changing, right? So that's the challenge is, you know, we don't have sufficient resources, so we need new models to get past it. So there's this digital vision that companies are trying to create, and it's very hard still to connect this vision. We know that what the vision is because we can see it happening in the outside world, right, in the consumer world. Uh, and that, you know, we want extremely easy to use technology that almost disappears. Uh, we want it to proactively help us, not wait, right? You know, why, do, why, why, doesn't, why do, do, does all my workplace technology do nothing until I tell it? And we've, ha we've had some help with notifications and other things, but by and large, we have, we have a very reactive uh, workplace even today. That we have these traditional heavyweight corporate solutions, you know, uh, that you know, bad old enterprise software that's way too complicated where 90% of the features aren't used. Now, how do we get beyond that? So we, so we have this much more self-actualized. Putting in app stores, uh, being able to let people pull the technology they need from outside and inside to create the solutions that they want. That seems to be where we're going. Uh, much more integrated and contextual workplaces. I can't believe how much of the time, even today, I have to copy and paste something from here to there. You know, when the, often the consumerized solution, I can go to Google search and I can type something and it won't even return the search results for what I typed. It says, I know what you actually wanted and I'm presenting that, right? You know, these kinds of things are very common on the outside, but we, we don't have them much in the, um, uh, in, inside the enterprise yet. And we've had these concepts of B2B and B2C, these artificial barriers between these groups. Uh, and we seem to be shifting now understanding, and we'll talk more about community in just a minute. Uh, that, that, that's really about business to all of our communities, our workforce communities, our partner communities, our external stakeholder communities, whether those are our customers or advocates or who else, that the future lies in that immense power. Communities are, as we'll explore here, the most powerful human construct that we know. They always have been, but now we've digitized them. And my, aren't they wonderful? They can be if we have them. So engagement has changed. Same thing with this kind of large-scale principles. I've been trying to make the argument at least recently. There's, there's basically kind of two top-level principles sitting over how we're, we're going to be doing this. One, you know, and neither one has dominance, right? But they're both growing. We'll, we'll look at the numbers in a minute. One is customer experience management, or some people call it now digital experience management because it can't just be customers. It's got to be everybody, right? Uh, but that, so, so working that out. But it's a multi-billion dollar industry saying, let's make all of this stuff consistent and integrated and feel the same and look the same, no matter what channel you're in, right? What, what digital experience that you're in. That's one model. Uh, but this really talk about the important piece where social business says, well, let's talk about how we're gonna work together, how information is gonna flow, how things are gonna be shared, and let's talk about that strategically, right? So there's, there's these two kind of, they're overlapping, but they're not really closely related. So 
Um, and they both represent big industries in the technology side, right? So companies like Adobe and uh, Sitecore are on the, 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 the digital experience side. Uh, and you have you know, folks like IBM, uh, Microsoft, and others on the social business side. Um, and so we're trying to figure that out. Uh, and the, but there's a great motivation for doing so. As we see in all of, I've been look, looking at all the digital transformation surveys. Digital transformation is the big topic right now. It's the hottest topic in technology, enterprise technology, right? Saying we have these traditional businesses that have some technology inside, but we, re, we need to rethink them in digital native terms and, and, and explore the art of the possible and truly unleash what they can do, what those technologies can do for our business. Um, but where the focus point of digital transformation, what always boils up to the top now is this, is this customer experience. How, uh, that seems to be where the competitive advantage lies. And the data now shows that. There's a yearly study that's, being d uh, that's done, uh, do I have the name of the watermark, that looks at the performance of companies, they look at the financial performance of companies that have high levels of uh, high quality customer experience. And, they, and customer experience leaders significantly by a large margin outperform the market. Um, the market being the S&P 500 index, which is a which is an outstanding benchmark in general. It's held, held on for decades as being a high quality benchmark for financial returns. Where customer experience laggards are greatly penalized. So I'm just now looking at this data. And they're not the only ones that have captured it, but they've, they've made the clearest story around it, saying that, well, the, the most, one of the most important places to really uh, to, do, to do this, to digitally transform, is to rethink how we engage with our most important audience, right, our customers. Uh, yet when we look at digital workplace, the customer is almost entirely absent. In fact, there's often an artificial barrier. If you ask me, there's one reason why we're still doing email today, um, uh, and that's the primary tool for business communication, right? Uh, even though the technology hasn't substantially changed in over 25 years, that's unlike any other part of the technology business, right? Uh, the rest of the world has moved on. All the data shows that e email is just like falling like a stone in the consumer world. Uh, but the only place where it's rising, in the business world, is rising steadily, single-digit growth of, of a number, uh, volumes of email. Why? Because you can talk to anybody, right? Everyone's got an email address, uh, and it works. And so we're still trying to figure, out, figure this out. We, we're, we have some fundamental pieces that we don't have to fit together. The latest digital experiences and digital workplaces don't take into account communicating, at least they don't take into account very well, right? Some of these, some of our solutions now have ways for you to kind of carefully bring in some people on the outside. This is a surprising regression to me, uh, and I think we can do better, but it shows how we're still trying to work through our thinking on this. So again, if you look at other, uh, this is another uh, uh, cross checks. Uh, again, customers, um, companies that, that um, invest in customer experience have much higher degrees of customer loyalty, right? They, people love that experience and that's the, what they want and it has a significant competitive advantage, double digit benefits to the organization. Uh, so same thing with, uh, if you look at where, where digital engagement is going with marketing, that's, that's kind of the point of the engagement funnel. We talk about the consumer world. Uh, things, the top three are marketing, uh, automation, content marketing, which is sharing information, usually uh, or often in social channels, and then making sense of it all. All of this engagement inside our organizations and outside is throwing off data. And we're now starting to get really smart about that. And we're starting to get a lot of tools to deal with it. Now, I don't know if you've seen the, the big data um, or the marketing technology vendor charts. They've gone from being relatively simple affairs three years ago to these vast posters of all the things that are available. Uh, we do live in exponential times. Uh, and I hear all the time from people saying, I'm trying to create a digital strategy. It, that, it makes sense for all of this. We have, to, we have to engage with our consumers and our customers, right? We have to engage with each other. We have to engage with our partners. And there's just way too much stuff out there and it doesn't talk to each other. I'm gonna give a, a shout out to Maureen Blanford. Um, uh, you can find her on Twitter, uh, B2B Maureen. Uh, and she's wrestling mightily. She's trying to build a, 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 a digital stack that will handle all of our activities inside of the organization, sales, marketing, customer care, operations, all that kind of stuff, and say, how do we do it? And none of this stuff will fit together. It's just this, this groundswell of technology. Um, 
And so that's really the challenge. Uh, we see that <clears throat> the tools that we have and the channels we have to deal with vary widely by what business that we're in. Right, so there is no one size fits all here. That's, that's the message here on this chart. Uh, where people hang out and what channels they use. Uh, if I'm inside my company I, I, uh, and I'm working on a small team, I'm going to have a strong tendency to want to use uh, small scale tools, team collaboration applications like HipChat and Slack. Right? If I'm working on a big project, I'm going to probably go to things like SharePoint and IBM Connections saying these things are for mass collaboration. That's great. Um, and then we have all, all these things on the outside that we use to engage with each other uh, as well. So these, these experiences, we have to really have to have this, this, this broad concept of, of engagement. And the data shows that it's all going mobile. Yet this is probably the place where we're falling down the most in the enterprise. Uh, these, these new mobile platforms are huge, they're complicated, they're, and they're very powerful and exciting. They can do things that, that we couldn't even imagine a couple of years ago. Uh, but that isn't being taken up in the enterprise. Um, most companies are not developing mobile apps for their business. They're usually just buying something off the shelf, if they're even doing that. We're really, really behind, both in field enablement and office enablement. Uh, yet the world is moving, you know, uh, all the news about te technology, if I go to like Engadget or any of the, 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 the news outlets around technology, all they're talking about is mobile because that's where the, all the uptake is. So in addition to all these other things, we have to think about many more channels and platforms and abil amazing abilities, really, truly, uh, especially on the analytics side. Uh, and we also have to think about these new touch points and new platforms. Mobile first is a mantra I began to hear three or four years ago from CIOs. Um, and it, it still is uh, very much a mantra in, other, in a lot of organizations. We have to figure out how we're going to do that. And what's nice is, we see, um, and this I think, I think one of the most interesting parts of the new digital workplace, these large companies, Apple now has an everyone can code campaign. Everyone can build an app. Anyone can do it. Google has the same thing. Um, and other large companies, Salesforce also has, a, you know, this now has, this has become so easy that anyone can be a developer to the point that I've now been tracking this entire phenomenon called the citizen developer. Thing, tools like If This Then That, I don't know if you're familiar with those, you can build really, anyone can build really simple applications that are highly useful. Uh, Zapier and other, others are um, building these platforms allow us to very easily integrate things in a business context without any technological help. Um, and they're, and they're start, it's starting to get uptake. So what's very exciting is that we have a completely new dimension to the digital workplace where we're much more makers and designers and developers where we can take the raw resources of our of, of our digital envi work environments and be able to build the experiences and build the solutions we need to run our businesses to automate our businesses to collaborate with each other uh, and so these are these are I, I think exciting times but we're not I find that most digital workplace plans don't include any of us even though these are things that are actually happening and along the way and I've been trying to spend a, a, a reasonable amount of time, but it just industry has become so big so quickly. This is the Internet of Things. Um, the new digital workplace, the one of a, in about three years, is where every single non-trivial object, and some of your trivial ones too, are going to be connected. Uh, our, our, our organizations will be fully instrumented, and, th and, these, and everything we have will be throwing off data 24-7. I'm not just talking about in you know, assembly lines or in factories. I'm talking about everything in the workplace, right? Uh, and everything in our homes, too. You know, so er everything is getting a, c a connection. There's now these um, Internet of Things, uh, in, you know, platforms on a chip. The chip is about the size of a grain of sand. It has a battery that lasts 10 years, can do low energy Bluetooth, has sensor br it's bristling with sensors, and can be embedded in anything. And when I talk to these consumer product companies like Nike, Nike's like, oh, yeah, everything we make is going to be connected within the next few years. If we don't do it, then, then someone else is going to be providing all of those valuable services to our customers, right? Be able to manage everything, every type of, every object that you acquire from Nike, you can manage to, you know, where it's located, uh, does it need cleaning, um, uh, how often you've used it, on and on and on. So there's lots of issues brewing with that, but it's going to happen. Uh, I, I love this title. I didn't write this. The Internet of Things is a hot and beautiful mess. Right, until it becomes the internet of everything. 
So this by the way really is where the digital world and the technology world are really converging. And we used to say, we still say it sometimes, um, that we want to do something on, on, on one of these devices. I don't have my phone, it's over there. We want to do something on these devices. There's an app for that, right? I've done that. I go, hey, this should be a lot easier to find this hotel room or do this thing. I'll go find the app for it, right? Well, now we're going to go pretty soon and find the bot for it. Bot as in B-O-T. Uh, these are conversational user experiences, and they're going to be in the workplace in a big way. Uh, they're already here. If you're using Slack, you, you've already been pulled into this world of these useful, smart, intelligent, um, uh, co conversational, um, artificial intelligence-powered uh, software robots that allow you to do anything for it. I use the scheduling bots. I love those. So I have Slack connected to my Google Calendar, and when I want to meet with somebody or someone wants to meet with me, I go and, and send my bot to go talk to them and say, um, you know, talk to their calendar if they can't do that to negotiate a good meeting time and everything gets set up. I'm not involved at all, right? There's a lot of such email services like that as well. But the, the bottom line is, is we need to continue removing the friction from using all this digital technology. We have so much of it, we need to have higher leverage user experiences. We need to take the friction out of it so we can get more done, right? So. You know, I can now already, on Siri, uh, with iOS 10, I can just say, Siri, order me an Uber. And it, it, Siri knows where I am. Everything's already set up in Uber. It is, she just does it. I don't have to do anything. I just get told, your Uber is arriving, is the next thing I see on my Apple Watch, right? And it's, that's, that, you can do that today. So what's starting to happen, there's a big investment in this. Uh, I, uh, IBM has Project Toscana saying, that's the next big thing. We're going to be talking to everything, not just typing. We're going to be talking uh, to all of our software uh, very soon, and it's going to be all agent-based. We're going to ask to do things, look up things for us, and take care of things. It's, the, it's where we're actually going to get leverage in our workplace for the first time that we didn't have before. And it's going to be very contextual because these things are going to have to work. They have to have access to our apps and our data, right? They need access to our business data. They need access to our calendar and email and our contact lists and our social networks. So you can say, hey, you know, Siri, can you go start a conversation on Twitter and Facebook? By the way, you can also do that today as well uh, because you don't, you're, you're busy walking down the street or going to the office, right? So these, we're going to be able to use these new digital workplace technologies in a far more effective way. How big is this? I was uh, doing some research uh, into that. There's been 300 startups launched in this space saying they want to be the next big front end for everything that we have. Now, of course, Apple already has Siri, and you know, Microsoft has Cortana, um, uh, Amazon has Alexa. So the big firms already see this. They see this as the next step in digital engagement, conversational user experiences where we can very effortlessly ask these agents to do things with all of our data and apps for us in a very efficient manner. So it's another, another piece, that's another trend. I don't know whether I put that in building blocks or trends. Right now it's in trends. Um, but we'll be in building blocks soon enough. So bots will be on the front line of engagement. I've been talking to the community manager um, um, industry, to Rachel Hoppe and Carrie Basham Young. She's the founder of SocialCast. And I said, hey, I already see this. Most of our low-level community management should be done this way. I uh, no sooner do I was saying this on Twitter, I was asking them, and, and when I had several people, companies come up to me and go, oh, we're already working on that, right? So, you know, again, we'll be able to take and automate most of the low-level drudgery in our workplace now for the first time using these new agents and these new natural language processing and a little bit of art artificial intelligence. So that, that's also coming quickly, very quickly. Uh, and along the way, this all has to be, we have to start shifting this so that we start thinking about our, that our truly our digital business models. We look at, you know, there's a, there is a strategic conversation happening up at the next level. And that is, what can we do when we actually have our stakeholders in communities? So companies have built and then connected communities for tremendous economic benefit. So Uber has a, a community of drivers and it has a community of people who need drivers. And what it's done is just when it pushes those two together, it can then put a business model and connect the two of them together. And, it, and they keep, as you, if you've been tracking them, adding new business models, saying that's an incredibly rich intersection. Right? What, you know, once we have digital, digital workplaces that are 
community oriented, right? That have been structured in that way. It opens up those possibilities, right? We can start saying, all right, now we can start um, you know, making business decisions uh, and, and carefully, very carefully situating business models in, the, in those intersections, right? So that's the next conversation, and that's big. This, this is what the startup community is thinking about. They're hurrying up and saying, we've got to build these communities and do these types of things. Uh, now, I, I totally will debate with you, I, and I've had people say, but those really aren't communities in the traditional sense. No, they're different kinds of communities, but I'd rather see what we, would, we think as community being used in, the, in that context than some of the kind of the more transactional, faceless communities that that some of these startups are using, right? We can do it better, I believe. So where are we with social business? I'm still very passionate. I wrote a book called Social Business by Design. It's done very well. I've, I've been contacted by people around the world saying, we've used it as input to our blueprint for digital workplace and the future of work and all of those exciting things. Uh, it's still the top level construct. It's doing really well. It's estimated to be a $23 billion industry by 2019, growing at 26% annually, says a study by Technavio. That's, that's on the low end. I've seen the higher numbers, right? Um, that is a, that's a significant uh, percentage of the entire software industry. I mean, it's not a majority of it. It's, it's more like 8 to 9% eight to of the whole software business, which is saying a lot. So we have some maturity. We have some organizations that are great poster children, uh, but I, I see ebbs and flows. It seems hard to sustain for some companies. You know, we can look at others like W.L. Gore is still the best poster child saying, you know, we don't even need the technology. It's helpful to us, but we are fundamentally or, you know, self-organized as a company. So there's, some, there's a few organizations that have had real consistent staying power with it and have great case studies. And there's other companies that don't want to talk about it like Valve. You know, Valve is a, a very large, famous software maker. They make computer games, but you know, they're very, again, using these principles on how they actually operate their company. It's very interesting. Um, where we are is that the platforms now in, are in a majority of our organizations. So I remember at Jane McConnell was um, at one of Bjorn's events, you know, saying that, hey, you know, we're, we've hit this high watermark, um, you know, of 50% of a couple years ago, and now it's at 65% have the platforms. Doesn't mean they're using them well, they're adopted well. But most organizations have come to the conclusion that they at least have to have them, right? And they have to figure them out better. Uh, and we still see all too often, you know, Bjorn was lamenting, we're still having the beginner discussions, not the expert discussions. Companies are still taking these and putting them way off to the side and going, waiting for something to happen, as opposed to putting it to in the middle of where they work, work is done. So we, we still have a lot of work to do. But we've made some interesting discoveries recently. So this isn't brand new. This is just a couple, three months old now. When I presented it uh, in Paris, uh, it had come out the day before. Um, so on average, half of social business uh, stakeholders say social tools have better enabled digital activities. Um, but some have really reported very high benefits. And these are not, and this is what I mentioned about, not in the sexy areas of our business. But they're in areas that, that for, the, for the leaders of our organizations, are going to be very interesting. So in particular, there is a, a great deal of, of, of share of organizations that say social um, has enabled digitization, uh, especially in back office proc processes, order to cash, demand planning, product development, R&D, although that's, I think that's a pretty exciting place for it to, be, to appear, supply chain management and procurement, right? Uh, this is from McKinsey's new study, how, to, how social tools shape the organization. Um, when you look at some of the other areas, it's very low. Uh, it's, it, organizations just aren't, even though they're really trying, haven't reported as much benefits. By the way, almost universally, it's better to do it in any part of your organization than not. But there's, these are the areas where it, we see much higher um, uh, return on value. In that same study, uh, in, in 2,000 respondents of large organizations, right, they say, so where do you think this is taking us? Now that you've used this a bit, where is it taking us, right? So this goes to the trends. Um, and most of them said, something that I think we would, most of us would find obvious. Employees can communicate more often with others in different teams, functions, or business units. In other words, these tools break down silos. It's a no-brainer. But other top candidates include day-to-day -day work can become more project-based instead of team or function-based. Um, and I know a lot of organizations, they, they, that's what they want, is get away from the functional model. The functional model is the siloed model. Um, and we can get away and we can work as knowledge workers on projects. In fact, Dave Gray has noted 
that the most effective companies in the world use these work pods. They're kind of more project or product based. They, they come together dynamically, they get something done and they disperse, no longer tying up resources. They can go do something else that's valuable, right? That's what that means. Teams can self-organize. Boundaries between employees, vendors, and customers can blur. I think that's self-evident, but I'm not sure a lot of people are ready to hear that. But the key here, and this is uh, another also really great piece of research. It? it is meaty. It'll take you a long time to get through it. Um, this is, uh, it's the UK uh, head office for digital transformation. I can't remember what that stands for, but it's, their, it's got an ironic name, their boiling frog report, right? Because that's what most of us are, right? right? We're in this rapidly warming digital water, but it's not warming fast enough to, for us to notice how much it's changing. But these are the big changes. I'm not going to go through this. It's worthy of study, though. This is one of their top artifacts saying, we're going, we're going to have less of this and more of that. And bottom line, much more dynamic environments, much more loosely coupled environments, much more ecosystem-based um, workplaces and business models, right? Uh, where change can be supported at a high rate. Uh, this is one of the lessons, the big lessons that we learned is the network will do the work. So I'm going to take you through a brief tour of the building blocks. That was the trends where some, where some of this is being taken. How are we thinking about it at the big level? Some of the big technology disruptors, you know, all the way down to th things that, you know, conversational user experiences. Is that really strategic? It's at the very, it, it's right on the line, right? But it's going to change the workplace like never before. So those are important trends. So let's talk about some building blocks here. Um, Building block number one, this is from uh, the, the Paris Summit. And I thought this is a, a brilliant quote from uh, Gabrielle Maltini. Digital is not the big breakthrough, breakthrough, it's the change in people's behavior. It doesn't mean the technology is unimportant. But what is important is that we're changing now as much as, as it is changing. We've all seen this. Uh, you know, the example I often use is, you know, 12, 13 years ago, people would say, almost everyone would say, I would never put anything about myself online. Now it's the exact opposite. You have to be there. That's where all your friends are. That's where your family is. They're on Facebook or whatever your favorite uh, social tool is. Um, and, that's, and that's how they work. And you have to be on LinkedIn. You have to be putting your ideas as a professional out there to be part of your industry. You have to be there. You have to be seen. That's what recruiters look at. That's what, uh, that's what your colleagues will look at. Uh, and so th one of the, the big changes, finally, that we have changed with it, right? And the key here, and the part we cannot lose, and I think we've started to lose with these very siloed models of thinking about engagement, is that engagement is part of a continuum. We have to be connected to everyone. Uh, and we have to design these, our businesses so that we remove these barriers. And we're not, we're not doing that. And a part of this is the technology is really, again, focused on certain audiences inside our functional organizations. And... Unfortunately, that's, that's perpetuated this problem where we, where we kind of have these barriers we shouldn't have. But all the data I've surfaced, I, I collected 100 high-impact examples of where communities really changed, digital communities really changed uh, the business performance and the, and, and the, 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 the future tra um, uh, trajectory of organizations. Uh, communities are the construct. Uh, and building block number one, by the way. People, in other words are the most important piece. Now, hierarchies, bureaucracies, and other methods of control, the traditional way, have some value. They just don't have as much value as this in general. There's very little they can do that, that can't be done much better using, these, using groups of, of people who have a shared common interest and want to accomplish something. Open source software proved this, is repeatable, can generate hundreds of billions in economic value. Right? And now this has started to move into the way that we operate our businesses. Right? Um, and the two rules are, don't ever break this. These two rules. Anyone can participate, and when shared value is created, it's open and shared by default. Right? So this, that's the simple change from the old version of the digital workplace, where you create something, but it hides in your email or your file share or inside your document. Um, a repository shared folder that no one else can get to. By default, in these new environments, things are shared. You can make them private if you really need to, but by default, they're shared. It's a very simple change that changes everything and, and creates a knowledge landscape and creates collective intelligence and creates all these wonderful things. Only be done through communities. So more connectedness, more shared value. When we climb this curve, 
from team based to department scale to enterprise scale to ecosystem scale to everybody scale. When I look at the case studies of what was achieved on the higher up on the curve, they blow away what's being done down here. Almost invariably, we think too small when we think about collaboration. We think too small about business processes. The more they're open, the more your communities are plugged into them, the more magic can happen. I, we, I know I've, in my previous um, um, speeches, I've, I've presented case studies, but we know, we know this to be the case now. Uh, and we've made some hard lessons. We've, kind of, we've moved from the top of this on down, right? So we, we learned about email that interrupts work that at most it scales to thousands, and I hope you're never on a thousand person mailing list um, or, or CC list. Uh, it's not openly visible and shared with all. It's only, we have to have perfect foreknowledge of who should collaborate. And like we, we learned with Agile methods, we almost never have perfect foreknowledge about what a system should do or what its requirements should be. We just don't have perfect foreknowledge, but that's, that system assumes that. doesn't work very well, anyway. Um, but it doesn't need new digital skills. Everyone knows how to do that. So we, as we go down this list, we can see the scale really increases. We've learned that that's better. Scale is better. More people we involved. I mean, scale kills conversation at a certain point, but there, there, are, there are constructs inside community to deal with that. That we learned that sharing by default is super important. We can make it private if we have to, but most things shouldn't be made private. Um, is that makes no assumptions on who should be involved. Someone sees an exciting business process saying, hey, that affects me. You know, somebody's working out loud inside the organization. People can join in and help create a better work product. That's how we learn that from open source, that we let anyone participate. Great things can happen. Not good things. Great things tend to happen. Uh, the challenge, though, with these newer methods is that they're, they require a, a few digital workplace skills we're not teaching. Right. I mentioned working out loud, but that's one of them. That's a foundational piece. And, and thank, thank you, John Stepper, for, for making, that, making that, you know, have such broad awareness. He wrote a great book on that subject. Um, and a few other things. We have to have community management with, to, make, to get the most from these platforms. And that's what we've not expected. So that's kind of this progression that we've made and what we've learned. These are all key building blocks. But in general, you want to be down at the bottom, not up at the top, right? Uh, but that's not what we do. We're in, our bit, in, in the business world still, we're, all, we're up here at the very, very top, most of us. And that's not the place we want to be. We know that that doesn't work very well. Uh, along the way, we've learned that the, the network will do the work if you only let it, if you only open up, if you join that community and work out loud in it, then you create these great shared work products, these great outcomes that are far better than anything you could do yourself. Uh, I used to, and I still see this all the time, um, uh, is when an when a organization rolls out an enterprise social network, they find all sorts of duplicate work happening because things are starting to be published and shared uh, online and people can find it. The best example is um, a couple years ago, I found um, that two, this great story, they came and said, we, we found two groups that were building these Hadoop analytic clusters. They're both about the same size. One was like 40 and the other one was like 50. And they discovered each other's reports online. They're going, you're working on almost exactly the same thing we are, but we never heard of you guys. Why don't we pool our resources and, and get, get more done? That's a very common model. These are all the examples of how the network has these unintended consequences that are by and large very good. Uh, and we don't, and every time you don't share by default or let anyone participate, you turn off that incredibly powerful capability. There's, there's a tremendous advantage, competitive advantage in innovation and reduction in cost and increasing the scale that you get from letting the network do the work. But unfortunately, most of us, we try, the, the, our traditional business thinking has told us to try and do it all ourselves and really we stay at the bottom of the value curve. We don't want to be at the bottom of the value curve. We don't want to be at the top of this chart. We want to be doing this, letting the network do the work. Uh, open source software products are started by a few people and completed by thousands, right? We see this in, in professional crowdsourcing as well. I usually set the example of Foldit. I don't have it here, but uh, I'm not going to, because it takes time to talk about, but it, it's changed the, uh, the course of human health all by letting the network do the work. 
And we're starting to see this too. In, in my practice, one of the organizations we worked with is, is, uh, is an executive relocation firm. They move, move the, uh, 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 um, executives from very large companies to their new positions around the world. And they found that collaborative process was a mess that had all these emails. And there was, there was an average of 30 vendors that help a family move. You're trying to get your new schools and all your utilities turned on, you have remodeling done, and all your stuff shipped, and, and your mother-in-law moved in. All, and all these people are involved. And when they use the old communication tools, it just broke down. So uh, we designed a new solution that put community in the middle. Every process started by, with, a, with a miniature community where everyone's onboarded, everyone can see what's going on and they reported dramatic benefits. They actually were able to increase the number of people and the number of services they could provide because at some point it didn't scale well, but when they used the community-based model. So just another anecdotal example of, of what can work here. So the other piece, and I mentioned this in, our, in the introduction with Bjorn, is we've been really poor, because it's hard to figure this out, at building management models. We started with the technology. And this chart is supposed to look wandering because that's where we've been. We've been wandering. First, we were given the technologies, right? All the different things from content management tools, unified communications, enterprise social networks, collaboration suites, all this stuff. Um, and we weren't given any kind of, you know, here's how you run your business with it. That, never, that part never came. You're supposed to figure that out yourself. Um, then finally said, hey, we need management theories. These things enable new things we couldn't do before, powerful new things we couldn't do before. We need management theory. And some of the stuff was fairly primitive. There, you know, wirearchy, great attempt by John Husband. Fantastic. He, he's been at these events a number of times. Social business is still a big one. Uh, Dave Gray has podularity. There's holacracy, which now hundreds of companies have adopted. Uh, there's responsive.org. That's Microsoft's attempt at doing it. And there, and there are now others as well. Uh, so, but there's no one's teaching the next generation of leaders. You know, the corporate executive board two years ago said network leadership is one of the biggest management skills that's missing, right? We all know about traditional uh, business leadership, but now we have to lead through our networks. And that's not something we teach in business school. And that's not what we teach in management school. So it's happening. We're, we're going to. The, uh, I, there was a great article that came out over the last few days saying, um, the revolution will be networked, and I, and I truly believe that. We're going, to have, we're going to network our core business processes, and some organizations have. You know, I cited that one example, but there are many others. We've heard stories over the years at these events about companies like Bosch and others that have redesigned their institutional processes, but the management theories are still primitive. So I make the argument, what people do is what defines digital engagement. And I mean by, if we look at the digital engagement value chain from inputs to the tools that you use, it's the activities that are the most important, right? They create the output and they create the impact. And we don't, when I look at most digital workplace strategies, they look at the tools, right? They take into account some of the inputs, some of the outputs, and they don't aim at specific impacts and they almost, almost always ignore activities. Because uh, it's a lot of design work, let's, let's be clear here. Um, but you have, you have to take, you can take things like working out loud, that should be an activity that is highly emergent. That you just do that, a lot of this stuff takes care of itself, right? It's some of the things that we've learned. Do I have proof of all this? That, uh, is, this a, is this a theory that's been validated in the field? No, this is what we're, we should be here doing together is starting to say, what should we be looking for? Let's look at our workplaces and experiment more and gather the, the organizing principle, right, for how this should work. How are we doing for time, Bjorn? Okay. So I'll, uh, there's not much left. So, um, so we've also, all this stuff has given rise to the collaboration paradox. The more tools we have, the less connected we seem. You can find my study on this. I looked at all their different functions and all their are different, or some of our different forms of communication. And I was able to find an example. There are intranets designed just for R&D. There are unified communication solutions just for legal teams. Um, there's all of this highly specialized, and they, they tend to get into the business problems. Uh, most of us have never heard of these. Some of, we've heard of some of them. But what's nice about these is they get into a specific function of our business and optimize it, right? Instead of being a just generic general purpose thing. Uh, yet, if we have to manage all this, and this stuff doesn't talk to each other very well except through email, um, what are we going to do? This is where we, have to, we need to bring order to the workplace. This actually represents value, but we don't know how to access it. 
We do not know how to situate this into our different functions to get more value, right? So that's so why I said we're still in the cave painting days of doing this. So the challenge we have is I've seen more and more companies report to me going, hey, we know that they're off doing this stuff on their own, right? They're in, they're in WhatsApp, they're in WeChat, they're in Slack, they're doing this stuff, and now we've lost control, right? And, and it's not a large percentage, it's usually like 25% of the companies. 25% um, of the activity in the company, but that's actually a lot, right? So that's an, another force that we have to fight. So what, we, what I've seen now emerging is, is now a no longer one size fits all collaboration model. We know it can't be. We know that we have to figure out what we're gonna do about this. We, now we haven't figured it out, right? It might look like something like this multi-layered solution. We're gonna end up with two major collaborative hubs with our apps connected to them. One team-based, one mass collaboration-based and all of our other, you know, our, off, our, our document and office of productivity applications plugged into them. I'm gonna guess that's where we're gonna go. And, I, and when, I, when I ask uh, a lot of uh, practitioners, they go, yeah, we have something that looks like this. So that's possibly the or organizing principle. But ultimately, we have to connect all these communities. That is so important, and we don't know how to do that yet. We don't have the right vehicle. That's the next generation. Now, some vendors are actually working on this now. Uh, I'm not sure we, the vendors are going to be the ones that solve the problem. Um, and digital transformation requires the whole organization. We have to do it with people. A community is the ba best platform for change. We have to platform our organizations. But I'll leave that, um, I'll, I'll kind of leave things right there so we can, we can continue having that conversation. To change, to drive these kinds of changes doesn't just require the people. They are already, they're already driving these changes. What we need to do is guide them, to empower them, to lead them, to say, help us design this digital workplace. You may not know what the rest of the organization needs, but you know what you need when you see it, right? We'll help you find it. We'll help you see it. And then we'll shape it together and solve some of these issues. And so I think, you know, if we can come together as an industry and, and find a better set of organizing principles. We can get our arms around the next set, next generation of management theory. Um, if we can solve some of these problems, like how are we gonna deal, when we have the fragmentation, we get things that are more situated and more valuable, but it's much harder for us to manage. Almost every IT department I talk with is saying, we only wanna buy one thing. I don't wanna manage five different productivity suites. That's crazy to me. Uh, but what if it's better for the business? We, and those are the questions we have to ask um, and say, what's, what is the right answer there? So hope that's enough provocative thoughts for, for this afternoon. Thank you. Great. Thank you.